It's a great joy and honor to be able to share the Word of God today and cold day here in uh, February. I feel like we've got a taste of winter again, but yet it's warm in here. Oh man, the Spirit of God is here, the presence of Adonai, and it's been good to be together in His presence. We greet all those who are watching online. Glad you can join us today. We pray for a blessing over you and your household as well. Well, we are uh, in our, I'm in my Exodus series here, the uh, Lessons from the Journey, and looking at the children of Israel's uh, exodus from Egypt into the Promised Land, and looking at it as a, a beautiful metaphor for our personal journey from bondage of sin to freedom in Messiah Yeshua. And it's a, I love Exodus, it's a great book of encouragement, and uh, I love being able to teach from it. And our Torah portion this week is called Mishpatim. And Mishpatim is generally translated as judgments. Uh, last week we had the ten words, and it was a beautiful reading there by Rabbi Ron and his daughter Teresa Terry there, and it's wonderful to be able to hear the ten words. We've got them there on our wall, uh, the bedrock of society. And this week we get the judgments or ordinances based off from the ten words. And it's interesting, the Torah is said to have 613 commandments, uh, and, and of those 613, approximately 50 come from this Torah portion alone. Uh, and so it's, a, it's quite a Torah portion. And it's, if you read through it, there's laws uh, there, judgments uh, regarding uh, human rights uh, and the sanctity of life and workers' compensation and tort law and theft and sorcery and loans and slander and oppressing foreigners and Sabbath rest and the Moedim, the appointed times, God's feast and festivals. And as we're reading through some of these, uh, some of them might sound a little tough. You read through there and you say, wow, that, that sounds like a, a kind of some rough laws there. Uh, but we have to remember that the Word of God is a progressive revelation. God is taking the children of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt and slavery. And uh, the Word of God, the Torah that came down, the instructions of Adonai were revolutionary in that day. And they were given to a people that were used to a slave culture where might made right. And uh, life was very little value. People, life could be taken. and uh, It didn't mean much. We look at the, the, the children of Israel, the, the Egyptian edict that the babies would be thrown to the river. You know, we can't imagine the cheapness of life, but yet we see the same thing in our day and time. And the Word of God certainly has a relevance for us today, even though we're 3,500 years approximately after the giving of these mishpatim, they still have a relevance for us today. And one particular verse that I would like to look at uh, uh, in this Torah portion, just as, a, as a, an example of relevance for today, comes from Exodus chapter 21 and 16. And Exodus chapter 21 and 16 says, anyone who steals a person and sells him or is found with him under his hand must surely be put to death. Well, what a text this is. Uh, this has to do directly with the practice of kidnapping and specifically in the context of slavery. Adonai says you can't go out and just go out and steal someone, capture them, and kidnap them. Uh, if you do so, you are found guilty. The Torah forbids it, and you're to be put to death. Uh, I can only imagine how America's history would be quite different if we had followed this Torah portion. Uh, imagine that if slave traders and uh, uh, th those who, uh, who sold slaves would have, been, uh, uh, would have been put to death. Can you imagine that the slave trade would have been abolished in America? It should have never, ever existed because of this law in the Torah. Imagine that. If we'd only followed the Torah, we wouldn't have had the mess that we had for over 200 years of people being violently stolen, and kidnapped from their native lands and brought to the New World on ships packed and the horrific tragedies of slavery. If we'd only followed the Torah, and I know some will say, well, I thought the Torah allowed for slavery. I thought that's where they got it from. No, that was a twist. That was a perversion of the Torah. If you'll read through, I did a study and I read other people's studies. The Torah never allows for the kind of slavery that we had. In fact, it condemned it. What the Torah did allow for was a, a series of uh, uh, indentured servitude where a person could work their way out of poverty or in many cases marry their way out of poverty. We looked at it in our Torah portion this week of a, a woman works for a family and the son likes her, he can marry her, he can't disrespect her. And so it's a, really a system of God protecting those that could otherwise be oppressed. Uh, and I would say it still has relevance for us today. 
I understand that human trafficking is worse now almost than it's been in America's history. If we'd only get back to what the Torah says, says and give us dignity and not take people against their will, we wouldn't have near the tragedies and, 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 uh, and utter um, despair that we've had for many, many years in this nation. I pray that God will heal these things as we come back to his word. Well, I would say that um, <clears throat> the scripture, as we've laid out, actually doesn't support slavery like we had. In fact, Deuteronomy tells us that if a slave ran away, that the children of Israel were not to return him back to his master, but they were to protect him. If someone was given injustice, if they had been kidnapped and wanted out of that system, that the children of Israel were to protect them. In fact, the, the, the Bible pictures a system that uh, is, is so equitable for indentured servitude that in this Torah portion, if they want to stay, that there's a provision for them to stay. But if they want to leave, that they can leave and they leave with their uh, husband or wife. That wasn't even heard of in American history. It was illegal for slaves to marry. So we see that the Torah is a completely different picture if we actually will read it. It's been, the story has been twisted, but that's why we're to, here to come back to the written word and to get back God's heart on the word. It would help us if we would maybe have asked the Jewish people, how does this actually live out instead of just coming up with our own ideas about Torah? But if uh, anything, the Torah elevates the roles of servanthood. It elevates those who might otherwise be downtrodden in society. It elevates the roles of the foreigner. It doesn't allow us to oppress them. It, it calls for dignity and human life, the sanctity of life, protecting the unborn in the womb. The, the Torah is a champion of God's humanity, of God's creation. It's been twisted, but it wasn't God's intent. God's intent was to lift people out of their situation, to give them a hope and a future. And as we look at the laws of judgments found in the Torah, it's amazing to see how those laws that were given approximately 3,500 years ago still have relevance and application today. I've included a slide there from the highway there in Galveston. There's a, the 10 words right there on the streets there of Galveston. And uh, certainly the Torah and the, the Ten Words have been a bedrock of society and our culture here in America. It's sometimes not always used properly, certainly sometimes misused and abused and used for our own people's personal gain, but yet uh, still part of a foundational part of our nation. And I would say we need to return back to the pure word, return back to uh, Adonai's mitzvot and commandments. Uh, but when Yeshua was asked about which one of the commandments was the greatest, he answered, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Be'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And on these two hang all the commandments. They hang all the law and the prophets. It all boils down to loving God and loving your neighbor. The rest is commentary. If we'd get back to loving God and loving our neighbor, we find that everything else would flow out of that. It flows out of a love relationship with our creator and a love for our fellow humanity. What a beautiful, beautiful message. We sing it each week. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But what does it mean to actually love God with all your soul? And that's what I actually want to look at today. And I've entitled my message, With All Your Soul. Well, what does it mean to love God with all your soul? In order to answer that question, we first need to answer the question of uh, what is a soul? We need to define a soul. A soul is kind of a difficult thing to define. What is a soul? But we do get an understanding from, of a soul from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. In Genesis 2 at 7, it says that God took from the dust of the earth and he formed mankind. He formed Adam from the dust of the earth and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So our soul is that eternal part of us that from, comes from God. Our soul comes from him and he's the one that gave us our soul and because of that, our soul one day will return to him. It's only on loan from him. It's in our earth or bodies right now. It's in this human tent of dust. Uh, but one day it will return to its source. And, uh, you know, as this week we had Pam Carney's memorial service. And what a beautiful memorial service it is. Those who watched online and those who could be here with us. We looked at Pam's life and there were so many testimonies of people who said that Pam's soul, that her life had touched their life uh, and her soul is now with Messiah, but everyone that knew her said that somehow she had touched 
her soul, her life, the essence of who she was, her faith in Adonai had touched them in deep ways. Uh, and when we look at ourselves, we recognize that we have a body. We live in this tent, in this shell, if you will. And that's our physical self. And then we have our mind, and that's our thoughts or our emotions. And then we have our heart, which this is the seat of our will. Uh, but then we have the soul, which I, I would equate to a supernatural life force that integrates all these together, that brings them all together into a living being. It's something like an operating system on a computer. Analogies aren't always perfect, and at some point in time they break down, but the thing that connects the keyboard and the software and all that, the operating system that makes it a complete unit. But when a person dies, we say that their soul has departed. They're no longer a living being. Without the soul, you're not alive. So how do we love God with all of our soul? What does that look like? Well, I believe we can find a principle about loving God with all of our souls in our Torah portion this week as we look at the Torah portion. Let's specifically look at Exodus chapter 23 and verse 27 through 30. It says, I will send my terror before you and I will throw out all the people whom you will come into... Uh, who, I will, sorry, let me start over again. I will send my terror before you and throw out all the people to whom you will come into panic and make all your enemies turn their backs to you. I will send the hornet before you, which will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in a single year. Otherwise, the land would become desolate and the animals of the field will multiply against you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you are fruitful. Then you will possess the land. So let's take a moment and look at this text. We see several things from this text. One, God has promised land for the children of Israel. He's promised them this inheritance, this land. But there's enemies dwelling in that land. And Adonai will drive them out, but he will do it little by little so that they can possess the land. I would say that Adonai has promised land for all of us. He has an inheritance for all of us. He, excuse me. He has uh, an inheritance, and I would say it's not just eternity. Too often I think we think of salvation of our souls as something that will happen after we die. We've all heard the uh, 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 message of, um, you know, believe in Yeshua so that when you die you go to heaven. I would say that's uh, uh, part of the gospel, but I'm not convinced that's the full gospel that Yeshua taught. Uh, I would challenge us to think of the saving of our souls not just as something that happens in eternity, but also something that happens right here and right now. We will be saved, but we're being saved. We will be saved, but we're in the process of being saved. And there, there are two different uh, systems that are happening, but it's happening uh, in our lives. Look at what Yeshua taught in Matthew 11, verse 27 through 30. He said, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yeshua here is talking about the here and now. Yes, we will find rest for our souls in eternity, but he's also speaking about right here and right now. He's saying that he will give us rest to our souls. Our souls come from God. Our souls belong to God. And our soul is not at rest until it's reconnected to God. That's why even if you're a non-believer and you're listening to me today and you hear this message, there's still something in you. It's called your soul that wants to be reconnected to its source, that wants to be connected to God. And in, in, in Psalm 42, David says, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longeth after you. There's something inside of all of us that longs to be connected to our creator. Now we can fill that longing with all sorts of things. We can fill it with our workaholic, workaholic tendencies or drug use or shopaholic or whatever it is that you try to satiate your soul with, but your soul will never be satisfied until it finds its rest in Adonai. And it finds its rest in Adonai, the way that we do that is through being connected through Yeshua. He says his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and in him we, he will give us rest for our souls because through him he's the way, the truth, the life. He connects us back to our source, back to the Father, and we find rest in our souls. 
You'll never find rest and contentment outside of Yeshua. There is nothing that will satisfy your soul like being reconnected through your, to your source through Messiah Yeshua. Our souls will be saved, but our souls are being saved. He is the one that brings us into our promised land of possession, possessing our souls like the children of Israel were to possess the land of Israel. Look also what Yeshua says in Luke chapter 21 and verse 19. He says, by patience, possess your souls. Through patience, we possess our souls. You see, our souls can either be at odds with God's will and ways, or they can be at harmony with God's will and ways. And when we're in harmony with God, we find that there is rest for our souls, that we can possess our souls. It's like the picture in Psalm 1 of the tree planted by the streams of living water. It's a picture of a soul at peace that bears fruit in season as roots go down into the ways of Adonai. It drinks from that water of the Ruach. And it's a picture of our lives at harmony with God. But when we're not at harmony with God, there's a war going on in our souls. Look at what 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11 says about that war that goes on. 1 Peter chapter 2 and 11 says, Loved ones, I urge you as strangers and soldiers to keep away from the fleshly cravings that war against the soul. Peter's telling us that there's, 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 we're not fully in our land yet. We're still strangers. We're still foreigners. We're not there. We haven't fully possessed it. And as long as we're still in this earthly tent, there is this war that's going on against the soul. The fleshly cravings are warring against the soul. And eventually that war between the fleshly cravings and the soul can lead to things like sickness and depression and anxiety and a host of other ailments. But let me make just a small disclaimer here. Let me take just a pause and say we are complex beings. We are physical, emotional, spiritual. We are complex beings and some things we, are, we just come to uh, biologically. We, we, we get DNA and some things just... You know, there's some things by living in a fallen world that physically, you know, that they, they challenge us. So I can't say that everything comes through stress or being this soul thing. There's some things, you know, Yeshua, he just said, he didn't even explain it to us. We, there's some things that are mystery that come down to us just because we live in a sinful, fallen world. So not all ailments are uh, because of this conflict of the soul, but certainly the medical field tells us that stress and anxiety can cause uh, serious sickness in our bodies. Stress can be a killer. It's one of the worst enemies of our, of our being. It literally kills. And, and certainly cognitive dissidents, this inconsistency of thoughts or beliefs and attitudes can make us very sick people. Our, our, our soul is, and flesh are warring against each other and left long enough, it will cause physical ailments, can cause physical ailments in our physical being and certainly in our, our emotional being. It can cause uh, depression and discouragement, all these things. We are not meant to be in this constant sense of turmoil. Yes, we live in a sinful, fallen world, but we can rise above that through Messiah Yeshua. I love the worship uh, this morning of focusing on Him. He rises us above the natural order into this supernatural order where our soul is connected with Him and we can, this, this war that goes on, we can live above that war. That's why we need the Ruach of Yeshua in our lives. The Ruach begins to drive out those enemies that war against our soul. But it happens little by little. It doesn't all happen overnight. Sometimes things go quickly in our lives. Uh, the walls of Jericho come suddenly crumbling down. But there's other areas that might take years to overcome. They didn't possess the land all in one day. I remember in my own life, I went through a season where I'd known the Word of God. I, I was raised well, but I uh, had some rough jobs. I worked in Alaska and different places, and some of the crew I worked with, and on the ranch out there, and I, I took a liking to tobacco. Uh, I knew that it was wrong. My parents had told me it was wrong, but I liked it. So that's what you did if you were a cowboy. You used tobacco. You couldn't be a cowboy unless you used tobacco. And so I worked on the ranch, and I followed suit, and I liked every form of it. I'll let your, uh, you know, there's all sorts of, I'd smoke, you know, every, every form of it. I enjoyed every bit of it. Boy, I enjoyed every minute of it. I figured I knew it was wrong. I knew that would be bad for my health. I thought, you know, it's just a phase. I'll give it up someday when I'm old and grown up and 
move past being a cowboy and working in commercial fishing. You know, you can't do it. It's part of your membership to the club is to use tobacco, kind of like big league baseball. You know, you can't be part of the big league unless you use tobacco. But anyways, I got to the point where I was ready to quit. I had grown up and all of a sudden I found out I couldn't give it up. No matter how hard I tried, I was addicted hopelessly to this stuff. I tried, and it gave me headaches and lightheaded. I felt horrible. I couldn't wrestle free of it on my own. No matter how much I made up my mind and my will, I'm going to quit. This is my week. This is January 1st. I'm done. It didn't matter. No matter how much willpower I tried to put towards it, I couldn't give it up. I was hopelessly bound and addicted. But when the Ruach of Adonai came into my life, suddenly I was set free. I never had a desire for it again. I've never tasted it again. Hallelujah. The smell of it even revokes me now. That's the power of the Ruach in our lives. And it wasn't my own mind, will, and emotions doing it. It was the power of the Ruach. And it happened overnight. But then there's other areas of my life that the Ruach's still working on, that it's taken some time to possess all of my soul. I'm not as patient as I would like to be. I sometimes get more angered than I think I should be, especially in Houston highways. But God's not finished with me. He's still doing a work, and there's still a possession of my soul. And you know, I've learned, you know what? I will get there. Maybe I just need to slow down five miles an hour and be at rest with my soul. I don't have to be out there in the fast lane driving and jockeying like NASCAR to get there first. Ah, I can be at rest with my soul, be at peace, move over a couple lanes and enjoy the drive. But I'm still getting there. I haven't fully possessed that part of my soul yet. I'm still working on that one. But that's where the challenge comes in. It's in the waiting period. That's where we need persistence and patience and trust that Adonai is doing a work in our lives. Just like the land of Israel, he's removing the enemies of our souls, but it's not by our own mind. It's not by our own willpower. I'm going to make a resolution this year and get it right. It's by the power of his Ruach. He does call us to do our part. And we'll look at that as we keep going forward. So let's keep going in our reading, Exodus 23 and 31. It says, I will set your border from the Sea of the Reeds to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates River, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you are to drive them out from before you. So let's pause there at this verse and ask the question, is God driving them out or is it you driving them out? A couple of verses ago, he said, I'm going to drive them out. Now he's saying, you drive them out. So what's the answer? Yes. Very good. You are a great Messianic Jewish congregation. Yes. It's okay to have some of, those temp, uh, some of those tensions in Scripture. It's the both and concept. Yes. It's God doing it, and it's us doing it. It's this beautiful cooperation. Philippians chapter 2 and 13 says... The one working in you is God, both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. He's doing a good work in you. And he who began the good work in you, he's faithful and just to bring it to completion. He wants you to possess all of your soul. He doesn't want you to live in a constant state of tension and struggle. He wants to have you in the promised land possessing the fullness of your soul. Hallelujah. It's for his good pleasure. We just cooperate with his work. So how do we do that? Well, let's keep reading. Uh, Exodus 23 and starting at verse 32. Make no covenant with them or with their gods. You must not dwell, they, they must not dwell in your land and cause you to sin against me. For if you worship their gods, they will be a snare to you. So what's going on here? He says, you must not make a covenant with them. I'm going to drive them out. It's going to happen little by little. But while they're dwelling in the land there with you, you must not make a covenant with them, for they will cause you to sin and cause you to worship their gods. They will be a snare to you. We know that this actually happened in Israel's history. Joshua made a covenant with some of the Hivites when the men of Gibeon came to him with worn out clothes and wineskins that were ripped and broken and dry and moldy bread. They said they were from a distant land. And what happened? Joshua did not inquire from Adonai. He used his own human wisdom and rationality and decided these people have come from a long ways away. 
let's go ahead and make a treaty with them. He went ahead and made a treaty with them not to wipe them out and found out that they only lived about five and a half miles away from what would become the city of Jerusalem. They lived right in the center of Israel. But he had made a covenant with them. He didn't follow Adonai's plan. He didn't get the mind of Adonai on it. He took it into his own hands and ended up making a covenant with them. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 7, we see the Israelites were forbidden from marrying the Hivites because of the foreign gods. These Hivites had become a snare right in their own land. They had made compromise. They had allowed this enemy to possess and stay in the land. So what can we learn from this text? I would say the key to loving God with all your soul is to allow his Ruach to utterly destroy any fleshly cravings that would war against your soul and not to make any covenant with them. Not to allow the fleshly cravings. Don't give them place. It's not, uh, it, it, what it means for us is not to make exceptions for them, not to make excuses for them. Call them what they are. Agree with what God says about fleshly cravings. Don't try to excuse them or try to write them off and say, oh, we're all that way. We've all got, oh, I'm just human and live with compromise in your life. No, that's not God's plan for you. God's plan for you is to go from glory to glory, not just to live as every other human. You're not like every other human. You have the Rook of Adonai in you if you've accepted him in. You're not supposed to just live like everybody else. Oh, I'm, I'm just human. That's just the way I am. You don't understand. I'm Irish. Uh, <laughs> no, you're not. You're a son and daughter of the Most High God. You are a son and daughter of the King of kings and Lord of lords, and those who the sun sets free are free indeed. You've got a new identity. You're not just a victim of happenstance. You're not a victim of your DNA. You're not a victim of where you come from. Oh, you just don't know my family. No, but I know God's family. And you've entered into a new family, and he will utterly destroy these things, but we can't make excuses for them or live with them and say covenant with them and allow them to remain in our borders. We have to agree with what God says. We have to agree with what he calls sinful and what he says need to be driven out. Look at what Romans chapter 8, verse 15 through 14 says. It says in Romans 8, verse, 15, verse 5 through 14, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Ruach set their minds on the things of the Ruach. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Ruach is life and shalom. For the mindset of the flesh is hostile towards God. For it does not submit itself to the law of God, for it cannot. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Ruach, if indeed the Ruach Elohim dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Ruach of Messiah, he does not belong to him. But if Messiah is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Ruach, the Spirit, is alive because of righteousness." And if the Ruach of the one who raised Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Messiah, Yeshua, from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Ruach who dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we do not owe anything according to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Ruach you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live." For all who are led by the Ruach Elohim, these are sons of God. You see, each of us has our own Hivites, our own Canaanites, our own Hittites. We all have our fleshly cravings that war against our soul. Uh, it, it, it could be anything from sports addictions to gambling addictions to gaming addictions to social media addictions, news addictions, shopping addictions, eating addictions, gossiping addictions, sexual addiction, drug addiction, you name it. What are your Hivites, your Canaanites, your Hittites? I'm quite sure that you're aware of them. They wrestle against our soul unless you've made your peace with them and you've made excuse for them and you allow them just to exist there. I pray that that wouldn't be the case. Uh, that we would recognize the enemy that would war against our soul. And regardless of what society says, we would say, that's not part of my package. That's not who I am. I am a daughter, and I am a son of the King of Kings. And I know that we will get in the victory over those enemies the same way. The enemies of our soul, it will come by the power of the Ruach. We spoke about it today. Restore my soul. Renew me. It's the work of the Ruach. It's not something where we make a mindset up and say, I'm going to get rid of all this stuff. I'm going to clean it out. I'm going to make a to-do list, and this is going to get done today. It doesn't work that way, friends. 
it has to be a cooperation between the rook of Adonai and us. And he's doing that work. It's him that works and does his will in our lives. Therefore, the key to loving God with all of our soul is to allow the rook of Messiah to put to death the enemies that would war against our soul. Our job is to keep loving him with all of our soul. And when we do that, we find that there, when we do that, we find that when there's something warring against our soul, something that comes between our love relationship with God, what we do is we ask God, Lord, help me to get rid of this thing. Go show me a strategy on how to defeat the enemy of our soul. And most time it comes just through worshiping, just worshiping. And when the children of Israel co uh, uh, conquered the enemies, each time God gave them a different strategy. If you look over the book of Exodus, each time was a little something different. One time was holding up hands in prayer. Now prayer is always an important part. But he only told Moses to do that one time. One time was marching around the walls with the worshipers leading the way and blowing shofars. Worship is an important part of getting the victory. One time it was uh, by setting an ambush. One time it was uh, with a jawbone of a donkey. One time it was with an ox goad. One time it was with, uh, when they heard the sound of the marching in the trees. Each time was uh, a little different strategy. One time it was Jonathan scaling the side of a cliff with his armor bearer. Each time... God gave them victory, but it looked a little bit different. That's because our lives are different. Each enemy is a little bit different, but the solution the same is the same every time is the Ruach Adonai. And he will give us the strategy. The scriptures give us different strategies to overcome the enemy. And certainly we can apply these strategies. Yeshua has told us that if we resist the enemy, he will flee. He also told us this kind only comes out by fasting and prayer. He also said, thy, the word tells us, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. There's all kinds of strategies in the scripture, and they're all great strategies. But we need the Ruach to tell us what is it that we need to do? What is that thing that he's uh, wanting to do in our lives? There, there are many strategies, but the, the key is not in the strategy. Otherwise, we would go out and get a self-help book and read, how do I get rid of this habit? That's not how God does it. We do it by worshiping him and allowing a loving relationship with God and his Ruach to do it in our lives, allowing him to lead us in the strategy that will give us the victory over the enemy of our souls. He's got promised land for us, and he wants to have us possess it. He's even more eager to do it than we are. He wants us to possess the land. And that's my prayer for us today, that we would fall so in love with the Lord God that our soul would cry out for him, the living God, that we'd be so connected to Adonai that when Adonai begins to identify an enemy of our souls, that we won't make a covenant with the enemy, we won't allow it to stay by making excuses, but rather we'll cooperate with the Ruach and we'll put to death whatever things that would come in between our relationship with him. There, it, it doesn't keep him away, it just causes this war in our soul. And we don't want to have a soul that's conflicted, we want to have a soul that's free to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So whatever it is that he puts his finger on, whatever it is that we would allow him in cooperation with his Ruach to put to death in our lives, that we could have this love relationship, and out of that love relationship that the enemies would be defeated, that he'd put them to flight, that he would give us the victory over them. If you look at all of Israel's victories, yes, they went to war, but you look at them, they're all supernatural victories. It was God fighting on their behalf. He was the one working behind the scenes over and over again. They, with 300, they put to flight thousands with the Gideon and the smashing of the pitchers. Each time it was a supernatural victory. But whenever there was sin in the camp or they allowed these things to happen, we see with Achan sin, they, 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 they didn't have the victory in their life. The same happens with us. If we keep that sin hidden or buried and we don't agree with what God says about it, it can bring defeat in our life. But when we come to God and we worship him in that deep love relationship, he'll scatter the enemy before us. He'll get rid of the enemies of our soul. So the goal isn't just to go around looking with a magnifying glass and say, you know, what's that thing that, that, that God, let the Ruach do that. He'll just shine his light on it. And you know, he does it so gentle. He does it just so amazingly. This has got to go. That's got to go. Not in condemnation, not in fear, not in, I'm going to smash you with this. It's a I love you. I want better for you than this. You're my son. You're my daughter. I look at that with Benjamin, and Benjamin's got some little things I'm working on in his life. He's just a baby, so my main goal is to keep him safe. But that's the same way as a loving father protects us. I don't want Benjamin to fall off the chair or to trip down the steps, so I put some safeguards in place. 
The same way God puts safeguards in our lives. He's watching over our lives. He wants us to have that deep love relationship with him. There's something in all of us, our soul, that wants to be connected to him. Each week, I trust that when we come together, there's something that happens when our souls connect with him in worship. But through the week, as you pray and read the scriptures, our soul connects with him. We're made to have that connection, to have no barrier between him. It won't fully happen until we reach eternity, but I believe in this lifetime, that we can get victory in these areas, that we don't have to live with a conflicted soul, we don't have to be at this constant tension, that we can live in the fullness of who he's called us to be because of the work of his rook in, in our lives. And remember that it's him doing the work. We just need to cooperate with it. Our job is just to love him, really. Just to be so radically in love with him that nothing else satisfies. You know, I, I remember when I was courting my wife, you know, I didn't want anything to come in between us. I couldn't wait to be with her again. And we, we, were, uh, we were courting in a, a school where, you know, we, we understood that there was physical boundaries and we kept physical boundaries, but we had great times together, going out to eat, walking in the park, sharing, you know, I can't wait to be with her. I think that's the relationship of our soul that wants to be connected to our, our God. Our soul come from him and it wants to be connected with him. And I would remove things from my schedule that would get in the way of going out with my uh, future wife. And I believe that's a picture of our spiritual eyes, that we'd remove those things that would distract or get in the way of our intimate love relationship with him, spending time with him, being with him, being in your presence. We sang about it today in our worship. In your presence, that's where I belong. In your presence, that's where I am strong. In your presence, I am free. That's the picture he's giving us. In your presence, oh God. When, the, when the, in his presence there's fullness of joy, in his, in his presence the, the things that war against our soul, we, we just almost effortly push, effortlessly push those things out of the way because it's warring against our relationship with him and we don't want anything to come between us and our walk with him. So as I close, I would challenge us to love him with all of our soul. What does that mean? I pray that we'd be able to love Adonai with all of our souls, with all of our being, that there wouldn't be any enemies of our soul that would be allowed to remain in the land, but that we would possess the land, that we would, through patience, possess our souls, that our souls could be connected to him afresh and anew, that our souls can cling to their source. Today, maybe you're listening to this online and you haven't found rest for your soul today. Yeshua says, come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'm not going to lay a bunch of requirements on you. I give you two. Love God and love your neighbor. That's not a heavy burden, but out of that flows everything else, all the other issues of life. But I attest to you, you'll never find rest for your soul, in your job, in your marriage, in your sports, whatever that thing is that you're pursuing to give you rest to your soul, you will never find rest until you find rest in Messiah Yeshua because that's how God made you. He is your source and you won't find rest until you reconnect to your source. You do that through Messiah Yeshua. I would challenge you today to take him at his word. He said, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy burden. I know some of you watching today, you are weak and heavy burden. You feel the tension of life. You feel the strains on your soul. I would tell you, come to Yeshua he said, lay your burdens upon me. He's willing to take them. He already died on that tree to take your burdens. He already paid the price. He already defeated the enemy. The victory, he already won. You don't have to conquer these things on your own strength. He already did it. All he's asking you to do is put your trust in him, your confidence in him, and he'll take that burden. He'll take care of those enemies of our soul, but he'll do it not from the external in, but from the inside out by giving us a new heart, filling us with his ruach. And the ruach will give you the strength to overcome these things, to, to get the victory. Maybe today you've been walking with the Lord for years and years, but there's still some areas that just, just an enemy that you've allowed to live in that area that wars against your soul. Maybe you've ignored it for years, but it comes up from time to time. Maybe Yom Kippur, these things come to mind. I would ask you to say, Lord, I just want a deeper walk with you. I want more of your presence. And I believe as you get more of his presence, some of these things will just, just stri be stripped away. Because his word says that he is doing this. He is working in you to will and work according to his good purpose. I believe that we can go from glory to glory, that we can possess our souls, that we don't have to live in constant tension, but we can live in harmony and peace. Because that was Yeshua's promise. He would give us rest for our souls. Yes, it'll happen when we pass from this life to the next, but I believe that we can have a taste of it. We can have the inheritance of it even here and now. Can you join with me as we close in prayer? 
Father, I thank you for your word to us today. I thank you for your ruach in our lives. Lord, it's your ruach that sets us free. It's your ruach that gives us victory over these enemies of our soul. Lord, we don't want to live in a conflicted soul. We want to live and possess all that you have. We want to possess all of our souls, not giving any ground to the enemy. Just as you called the children of Israel to possess the land, you've called us to possess our souls. Lord, I pray that through the power of the Ruach today, Lord, if there's any that don't know you today, they would accept you. If there's any that have wrestled with some of these areas, that through the power of the Ruach, their deep love relationship with you, Lord, that these enemies would be vanquished in their lives and that they'd walk in a new level of freedom and a new level of intimacy like never before. I thank you, Lord, for your word. It will not return to your void. Have your way, I pray, in our lives in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen.